be redirecting your. No, I don't know. I suppose I can. A lot we we uh, did research this uh, a lot when at different times in the policy committee. Obviously, the policy committee changes positions a little more often due to the political nature of some of the positions. And um, the parliamentary parliamentary procedure is that you don't actually have to be present to vote on it. You have to just you can vote on it whether or not you're in attendance. So that's what the parliamentarians told us. I'll trust the petty part. All right. We'll assume that you did your research on. Sounds like you. We did do our research. Okay. 18 years ago. Okay. Any, uh, any changes or discussions regarding the minutes from July 22nd? If not, any objections to approving the minutes? Hearing none, the July 22nd, 2021 minutes are approved. Okay, on to the meat of the agenda. Action items. So, on to action item 5A, the BPAC seat nomination. Craig, can you give us some information on this? I will. Our Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee uh, includes one specific seat designated as a bicycle organization seat. Um, so we're looking for someone who has that sort of background or works for that sort of organization or is involved in that. And in this case, we have Emily Weiser, who is uh, on the board of directors for Bike Anchorage. And uh, you can see by the memo, she's got a lot of experience using a bike as her primary form of transportation. Um, and so now, uh, fortunately, lives inside the municipality and uh, is the suggestion for uh, from Bike Anchorage for filling that seat. That uh, technical advisory committee two weeks ago uh, recommended her approval to you folks. So, okay. Any questions or comments from the committee on this nominee? Uh, and sorry to interrupt, but she is uh, dialed in in case okay. you have any questions for her, but she's online as well. Okay. All right, Emily, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you for attending today. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. Um, is there any additional information you'd like us to know about you, Emily, before we uh, move this forward for for a vote? No, I don't think so. I'm happy to answer any questions, though. Okay. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, of course. Rhetorical question. Um, <laughs> are you a resident of Anchorage, Emily? Yes, I am. Great. I'm glad to hear that. We've had non-residents be on committees before. We always appreciate community involvement for these these committees um, as they have well, much more intimate knowledge of Anchorage. So thank you for volunteering that. Yep. Okay. Uh, for the record, let Craig the record show that Craig Campbell has now sat in uh, as a representative or delegate for Mayor of Boston. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are on action item 5A. It's a nomination to the uh, Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Okay. Uh, Emily Weiser is on the phone. She is the nominee oh, uh, as approved okay. by the TAC. Okay. Um, if you have any questions for her, I have her on. Okay. Uh, we'll see if you can make a comment for her. Yes, Mr. So, Emily, this is John Weddleton. And uh, so I was on the um, inaugural committee for the bike ed advisory committee. So I have a real fondness for it. So we had a lot of fun and did a lot of good work. So thank you for um, offering to serve. Yeah, thank you. All right. Any further comments or questions from the committee? Okay. And Ms. Zolotel, if you, I, I can't see you, so if you do have any questions, be sure and shout out. Thanks. I'm good. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Uh, since there's no other further questions from the committee, are there any questions from the public? On this, don't have any in the chat right now. There's nobody just who's in this room. Okay. All right. Well, I don't hear any questions from the public. Uh, what is the will of the committee regarding this? Move to approve. I'll second. Okay. Move to approve and seconded. Any objections to approving the motion? All right. Hearing none, this motion is approved. Congratulations, Emily, and thanks again for uh, your future hard work. <laughs> Great. Thank you. The crowd's gone wild. <laughs> Record check. Okay, we have one more action item to consider today. Um, item 5B, the revisions to the Alaska Administrative Code for Pedestrians and Bicycle Safety, 
letter of support. Craig, can you give us some information on your file? I will start, but I'm going to have Joni give the, the, the meat of the matter since she's been following it very closely. Basically, our, our fellow MPO up in Fairbanks uh, has uh, authored a resolution related to something non motorized, and they have asked uh, for letters of support from different entities. Uh, if you look in the packet, you'll see that the city of Homer, among others, have offered some support. So they've asked for some letters of support. Um, and uh, our Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee authored such a letter, which is in the packet here, and it came through the TAC. The TAC actually, I think, suggested, if I have this correctly, suggested that Policy Committee write its own letter, but there is a letter there by the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Our practice in the past has been for the Policy Committee to um, either support or not support the letter from a certain any advisory committee. And that seems like a more seamless way to do it. But I'll let Joni explain the specific uh, main three parts of those revisions to the Alaska Administrative Code and uh, see if you folks are in agreement. Great, thanks, Craig. Yep, thank you. And um, thank you for having me today. Um, so this is, as Craig mentioned, this is our neighboring MPO up in Fairbanks, um, uh, FAST Planning. And so they wanted to write uh, some revisions to the Title 13 of the Alaska Administrative Code. And they are regarding things that are already widely adopted here in Anchorage that have already been approved here in Anchorage, but up in their area up there, they'd like to see these changes made to improve safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, and they're looking for some letters of support to um, have these changes made. So we have included in your packet, this is the letter, or these are the proposed AAC revisions. And the main three things on here are um, new provisions to improve safety of vehicles passing bicycles in the roadway. So it's a safe passing law. And what we have down here is a three foot safe passing law. So that means when you pass a bicyclist in a vehicle, you have to give them three feet of room. Um, so that's one. Number two is um, new provisions for bicycle lane and shared lane use markings uh, for riding bicycles on roadways. So those are uh, shared, and I don't know if you've probably all seen the facilities, uh, for example, on Arctic. Um, so we have a shared lane marking here, and that's, uh, we use that in places. It's not, we're moving towards separation where we can, but that's been something that's worked for us down here. So um, the third one is new provisions to improve safety and reduce conflicts for bicyclists and pedestrians with off-highway vehicles traveling on sidewalks and other locations officially designated for non-motorized use only. So here in Anchorage, um, we do have laws in place to protect that pedestrian and bicycle pathway uh, for their uses, um, but up there, and especially in Fairbanks, where I grew up, there's a lot of people um, snow machining and four wheeling, and uh, so they don't have that system of protections in place. So that's the other element of this. Um, if you have specific questions on the, the um, revisions, we can go over those here. Any change that they recommended is in blue. And I think in your copy, I also went and highlighted it in yellow, perhaps. We may have got that on the copy. Yeah, it looks like it did. But at any rate, um, or that's not that's not the blue piece right there. That's a letter. Yeah, sorry, people. So any of the blue text that those are the new um, the new proposed language. And as um, the chair mentioned, um, there is a, the letter or the word dangerous there. And I don't know if he wants to speak to that, but I did locate it. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah and then it's on. It doesn't have a page number here, but it's under 13 AAC. Riding bicycles on roadways and bicycle paths. There you go. Number three. So that reads when roadway or other conditions makes riding to the right dangerous or impractical. So, um, so it is suggested that we maybe remove the word dangerous. Um, so that would be something that we could talk to uh, um, Jackson Fox with the FAST planning group. They're the ones who put these together. So if they could change that before they submit it. Submitted. Um, but it, uh, yeah, what we're asking you to do today, sorry, to round out, what we're asking you to do today is approve the letter that the EPAC wrote to support <clears throat> these proposed changes. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, yeah. Questions from the committee? Um, 
I guess one on the dangerous, what, what, how do we word it in um, our Title IX? Because we have the same general rules. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Actually, I would have to look. Okay. And that shouldn't take too long to look up. Um, and then do we have that three foot rule here in Anchorage? We do. We do have that. Okay. So, because otherwise, I, I think this matches up it right does. where we are, except maybe that snowmobile section at the end. My understanding is Anchorage already has provisions for all three of these. We don't allow those off-road vehicles on our main roads, and we have the three-foot rule. We already allow Sharrow. So we're doing all three of them here. They're just asking for those changes. They're wanting to make those changes uh, take effect up in Fairbanks, and they're just asking for payments, letter of support for it. So well, they're asking statewide, though. So they, they want to change administrative. Code. Well, yeah, but but in other words, this stuff already applies here. So we, we're not, they're not saying. Gosh, you should do it down here because we already do it down here. So if we wanted to change that number three where it says dangerous to match what we say in Title IX, that's a, and then we change our whole letter. I mean, that's, I guess our letter would say consider changing it to this. Right. Reason. But I think we support their overall number. We just, we, we have, a, we would have an issue with putting into an administrative code that there's, yeah. there's an assessment that the bicycle. Areas are dangerous. It's, you could be riding to the right of the road and it's dangerous, and you're losing. You know, if there's a huge pothole or something, there are. That's why you move to the left. So we support them. We, we just propose the use of the word dangerous in the uh, administrative code change. Since it's uh, so, so we, excuse me, do we convey that to them? Well, this this would wait. This would be the letter that would go back to them from us that says we support you. However. Uh, we do not support yeah. the use of the word dangerous in administrative coaching. Um, Thank you. I think that seems important. Sure. <laughs> well, can you, so just that word in general, you don't like it? Okay. Right, uh, because it, all, it, it implies a designation or a, some type of assertion that by, by default, the configuration of the roadway is in fact dangerous right. to bicycle riders. We design our roads in compliance with state and highway national standards. Um, that's our go to. Yeah. If you want to put designation of danger on something we feel we comply with national standards. So if I dodge a pothole, it's because it's impractical, not because it's dangerous. Oh, so that's fine. That's, that's where you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we support their, yeah. their efforts to just. Uh, the use of that word is problematic for us. Sure, no, that's fine. Appreciate that. Okay. Questions or concerns? Oh. Ms. Zolotel, any comments or concerns from yourself? I'm fine, thank you. Okay. All right, so Craig, we've got a little discussion on uh, in support of this um, EPAC, I guess. Letter of support with the reservation, the use of the word dangerous and changes to the administrative code. Um, what do you think the best way to proceed? Do you, would we message that back to the BPAC and have that include that and have them include that in their letter? Yeah, my suggestion would be a motion to support the letter with the suggested changes of striking the word dangerous out of there. Okay. And then we'll send it back to the BPAC and they can create such a letter and just sign off on it and send it on its merry way. Okay. Um, so, in that vein, do we have a motion to support the letter with the uh, caveat of removal of the word dangerous? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. I have so, a comment. Please. Oh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I guess I would have preferred that we would have moved to support it and then debated or discussed the word dangerous on its own because I can't support the motion as it's stated. I can support generally um, supporting it. I don't think we should remove the word dangerous. I heard the explanation, but I think things have kind of been borne out lately that a lot of people, there have been a lot of issues on the road. So I um, I get the rationale from the state's uh, perspective, but um, it's not something I can support. Okay, so we have an objection to the motion. Is that right, Ms. Salato? Yes, I guess I, I would like to move to accept the letter and then there can be uh, 
a separate motion of, on the um, the requested amendment. You could do the uh, technical assembly thing and amend the amendment. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you I think what she can do is Meg, you can make a motion to support the letter period, and that would override. The one on oh. the floor now, that's how we do it. OK, then then I, I so move. So. So now it should get a second. And then someone can amend it and say, oh, and please amend it. So it strikes that they're dangerous. Then you could have a vote on that discussion on it and then vote on that amendment goes up or down. It's the amendment to right. strike dangerous passage. So she's moved to support the letter now. And that's what we're voting. Simply without the okay. the phrase. So is there you motion to approve the letter as submitted? Do I have a second on that? I'll second that. Second. Okay. And then we take a vote on that now. Yeah. Or we, we go back to the motion amendment. to delete the word dangerous. So a motion to delete the word yeah. dangerous. And there you go. Remove the word dangerous. Okay, do I have a second for that motion? I will second that. Two seconds. Okay. So now we have a discussion just about whether the word dangerous should be. Well, and so I've got. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, in our Title Nine, we deal with this, and this is um, your riders using right edge of roadway. It's uh, nine point three eight zero six zero. We say um, when reasonably necessary to avoid unsafe or impractical conditions, including, but not limited to, fixed or moving objects, parked or moving vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, animals, surface hazards, or when the travel lane is too narrow to provide for the cyclist and the overtaking motor vehicle to travel side by side with reasonably safe distance between the two or where it is otherwise unsafe to continue along the right-hand curve or the edge. So that's what we can move. So they don't use the word dangerous here. So I wonder if we can, is there another word that is it dangerous, but. But they, they very much paint a context in there. Well, they talk about yeah. all the kinds of things yeah, that, are, going on the that are unsafe, not inherently the design or the, of the geometrics of the park. Yeah, so I Meg, I wonder if, um, because I, I think the broader fear of having that word dangerous in, in this code is, I would trust someone who deals with this frequently, and, and maybe we could add then, so go ahead, remove dangerous, support the letter, and then maybe add a section to consider rather than using the word dangerous to um, incorporate, you know, our 9.38060A3. So incorporate the title name and language in place of. But just so they could read this and go, yeah. Because it's a little bit of 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 the current motion to amend wants to amend it to that i could support that okay this is a maker of the motion i'd ask that i withdraw that original motion to amend and substitute it with a motion to amend to delete the word dangerous but to add the subsection of title nine that was just read by assembly member wilton i don't have it in front of me 9.38.060.83 what was the very last part after 060 060 uh, A3. A3. Thank you. All right. So we have that motion. I was, I'll speak in favor of that. Okay. I have a second. Second. Okay. Second. Two. Okay. Are there any objections to approving that motion? Okay. Hearing none, the motion is approved. We tied up all the loose ends. Thanks. Okay. All right. You did. Much more Robert's rules of order. Okay. All right. Craig, I think that's wraps up 5B. Is that right? I think so. Okay. Well, then back to the agenda. Um, Craig, are there any other action items that we need to consider? For? No, sir. Okay. Item 6A, the MTP 101. Craig, do you have a separation on that? Mr. Aaron Young and Nalen will provide. The stunning FTP 101 presentation for you. Mr. Young and Ellen, this better be epic. So I'll Please be get right on the edge of your seat right now okay. just to be prepared. Yeah, thanks guys for really playing it up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, hello, everyone. I'm Aaron Young and Ellen. I'm the senior transportation planner with AMATS. Let me open the door real quick. 
and I will be the project manager for the 2050 MTP update. Um, so you'll see be seeing a lot more of me in the future, the next three years. So hold on to that. So today we're going to go over uh, kind of a primer for the MTP. What is the MTP? Give you guys kind of a basis for what you can expect to see when we do the update coming up here soon. Uh, really quickly, I am happy to announce we do have a consultant on board for the 2050 MTP update. It's R&M Consultants Incorporated. So we had our first project team meeting this Wednesday, and we're all very excited to get started on that. So we'll be bringing more specifics on that update later. I would like to keep our topic today focused on an MTP 101, which is a more broad, generic discussion, if possible. But after the presentation, I'm happy to answer specifics about the That's MTP. If anyone has any. OK, so a couple things to note. Uh, what does the MTP cover? Uh, what area are we talking about? We're talking about the AMATS area, as you can see on the screen here. Uh, it's the majority of the municipality of Anchorage, but please note that the north boundary stops at the Kinnick River Bridge, and the southern boundary, which is kind of hard to see on the screen, stops at the Potter Marsh Way Station. So it is not the entirety of the municipality of Anchorage. Uh, we do get comments about that all the time. We do not include portions of the Seward Highway South and Bird Indian Gird. So and that's another discussion. That we'll have. So, um, Christine, can you kind of scroll down? So I wanted to get uh, uh, go ahead and stop there. That's good. So I wanted to talk about the presentation itself. It's a little different than what we've done in the past. We've moved away from doing the PowerPoint presentation with the PowerPoint software, and we're moving into the story map side of things to give it a little more of a easier read and feel to it than PowerPoint itself. So the plan for this presentation is once I am done here today, we're going to have it online available on our website for people to be able to view and go through at any point that they wish. We're going to have a recording of me giving the presentation itself. So somebody not here at this meeting can go back and kind of follow through. And we're working on the logistics of that, but we'll get it set up. And one of the cool things about this is that bar right there where you see the different steps, you can actually click on one of those, go ahead and, and it takes you directly to the spot that you want to look at. So it's not kind of having to scroll through it. It's a more direct and nuanced approach to presentations. I love it. Uh, Christine Schutte helped me with it and she dragged me kicking and screaming into it. So I, I'm getting used to it because I'm a big PowerPoint presentation person. OK, with that aside, let's move on to the MTP. So what is the MTP? It stands for Metropolitan Transportation Plan. We are federally required to do this plan. Uh, every four years, we have to update this plan because we are a, an MPO, so we're governed by FHWA requirements that are found in CFR, uh, and I can give you specifics of what those are later if you need. What does it do? It covers 20 years of planning. So we wanna look out 20 years and say, what are our needs and how best can we address those through transportation projects, construction projects, plans, studies, policies, or action items. So we have to look at all of that and we have to incorporate it into a document. Christine, can you click on the timeline? So right here, we have a, it's kind of hard to see, but I'll walk through it. So this is kind of a general timeline of what an MTP update is. It takes about three to four years to do. As I said, we have to update it every four years. So for example, the 2040 MTP was updated August, uh, approved August 24th of 2020. So the next update has to be done by August 24th of 2024. So we can take a little less than four years, but they generally take three to four years. So what does it entail? Um, this timeline you see up here, I'm gonna go into a little more detail. I just kind of want to give you a brief, what are we doing? We do goals and objectives, performance measures and targets. That's kind of our start, you know, our vision of where we're heading. Then we go into our develop criteria and then do an analysis of our system so we can identify needs. Um, and then we do project selection. So we say, how can we help address those needs? And we do a fiscal constraint analysis, which is required uh, by EPA regulations. And then we have the uh, policies and actions. And then we go into our air quality conformity determination. That's another requirement we have by EPA and FHWA. Then we go into MPO approval, which is this body's approval of the document. And then we go into FHWA and FTA approval of the air quality conformity determination. I'll get into a little more specifics of that later. So. Any questions at this point? Okay. Well, could you I'm sorry, back up? It's a little hard to see maybe my angle, but so you start 
and the left. And that first bubble says what? It's um, uh, goals, objectives, performance measures, and targets. Okay, so the question is, I, I imagine you start, you look at existing uh, plans, Frank. I'll, I'll get into the specifics seven. if you want to hold on for a second. Sorry to interrupt, but okay. I, I do cover what you're talking about um, in the next section. So, okay, uh, can you go ahead and go to the vision one? Okay, and then highlight the image. Thank you. So first thing, goals, what are they? They are, what do we want to achieve? Objectives, how are we going to achieve it? Performance measures, how will we measure our success? And then performance targets, how will, uh, how will we know if we succeed? So goals tend to be more broad overarching statements. They are kind of the umbrella aspect of our plan where they cover as much as possible. So as you can see here, we have an example, uh, improve travel conditions, and our goal is develop an efficient multimodal transportation system to reduce congestion, promote accessibility, and improve system reliability. So as you can see, that covers a lot of different areas. When you get into objectives, they tend to be more specific and measurable statements. They draw from the goals and try and say, how can we implement these goals? And so in this example, we say improve system reliability for all modes. So a um, couple of things with goals and objectives. We are required uh, by federal regulation to account for the planning factors and national goals. There are <laughs> 10 planning factors and seven national goals that we have to cover. There's a lot of overlap there, so you'll have safety on the national goal and a planning factor, so we do have a lot of over, over, overlap that we deal with. The reason I mention that is because think of those as kind of our baseline that we start with. We start with the requirements that are outlined in federal regulation, and then we build on top of those as needed. So we can have things like uh, in the national goals and planning factors, there isn't an item in there for greenhouse gas emissions or climate change, whatever you want to call it. We can add something to that as a goal or objective is, if desired. Um, any questions on goals and objectives? So there will be a period for public involvement for the goals and objectives. We'll develop them. We'll put them out for public comment and then we'll respond to those comments as best we can. Okay, so relating, once you get the goals and objectives done, you want to show how you can actually, how you're doing and implementing them. That's where the performance measures and targets come from. Performance measures and targets have always been part of the planning process uh, since the beginning of time, basically. Um, but with MAP 21 and the FAST Act, the reauthorization bills that help fund us and give direction as to what we're supposed to be doing, they put performance measures and targets more in the forefront. So what is a performance measure? An example up here that relates to the goal that we talked about is percent of person miles traveled on the non-interstate NHS that are reliable. So you can see how it relates to that reliability metric that we were talking about, or the reliability objective that we were talking about earlier. And then you have a target. A couple of things to know about a target is you want a number and a date because you want to be able to say, okay, by this point, here's where we want to be at. Um, and please note, if you don't have a performance target, it, your performance measures are mostly meaningless. So we wanna make sure that any performance measure we have has a target. Now, performance measures and targets are uh, another requirement by FHWA. We have a set that we have to account for in our planning process. We are an MPO of 200,000 or greater, so we are a TMA. So we have more than other MPOs uh, to deal with. In this case, we have 40 performance measures and targets we have to account for as part of our process. Now, those are some of them that the state has to account for, public transportation has to account for, and the railroad has to account for. So we as an MPO are given uh, two options. We can set our own targets using our own data that we get approved through the state through a cooperative process, or we can support the state or whoever is setting the target in their efforts to get the target implemented. So for example, we have transit targets that we have to meet. We don't really fund transit, but they are a partner of ours, so we help support them as best as possible. So please note for performance measures, we are held accountable for them. While we don't have the same accountability as the state in terms of redirecting of funding if we're not meeting our targets, we are held accountable through our um, certification review that we have every year or every four years that says, how are we doing in implementing the planning process? Um, and we get, you know, no nos if we aren't meeting things as required. So we want to be very conscious in our efforts of what performance measures and targets we put forward. Any questions on performance measures and targets? 
Yes, Mr. Wellington. So we've defaulted to using the states for yes. as long as I've been around. So like, do we have any intent to like pull it like our, because we have vision zero, but we say we'll accept, I don't know what it is, 28.3 fatalities or something, you know, some number that seems certainly not zero. Um, do we have plans on, would that be part of this effort or is that something we need to do separately? Um, so safety is a tough one. Safety is a, a, unusual because a lot of the performance targets are only on the non-interstate NHS or interstate itself. So certain classification of roads, so the higher classification roads. Safety targets are on every public road and they have to be updated every year. And so it causes a few issues for us because we don't, we as AMATs don't really have the data. So we rely on the municipality of Anchorage and the Department of Transportation for their information. The municipality of Anchorage data is um, limited and it's what we have. And then DOT's data is statewide and it's harder to aggregate it down to the individual road itself that falls within our boundary. So right now we're supporting the state's targets. The plan is to continue supporting their targets until we can get our own safety plan, which we do have in the tip to get funded, to start doing our own data collection or analysis of where our data is lacking and start building up that resource for us to be able to use to set our own targets. Do you have a schedule for that? No. I think the safety plan is supposed to be funded in 2022. So however long it takes to get that done. Thanks. So it'll look uh, out, laid out in your unified work plan. In terms of what? Um, well, you've got line items in there that describe efforts or objectives, right? So the safety plan, is that where you we would find? No, it'd be in the tip. Be in the, the, tip the tip would fund it because we need to get a consultant on board to help with data analysis, data collection, any kind of that kind of stuff. So it'll be funded out of the tip, but staff time will be from the UPWP. And I believe we're having to update that here soon. So that'll probably be a line item in there for the safety plan. Yeah, my understanding in, in years past is that this, the municipality has avoided that because it's an increased cost gathering the data, you know, and, and all that stuff. So you've defaulted to the state's data, but now you're, you are gonna make a run at doing your own. We're gonna try. So that brings up a good point that I wanted to mention. So it's a lot of staff time and effort to do performance measures and targets. We hear endlessly from the public about how terrible we are because we aren't doing the same performance measures and targets that San Francisco is doing, for example. Well, they have 10 times the staff we do and bigger budgets. And so when we talk about measures and targets, it's a lot of data collection that we have to do. And we as AMATs and even the Muni and somewhat the state don't really have the resources available for it. So we have to be very strategic in our approach of which ones we're bringing forward. Safety is kind of, I don't want to degrade the importance of safety, but it's the easiest one for us to start looking at because there's already so much rich data out there that we just need to refine for our area. When you're talking about other performance and measures and targets like pavement and bridge, those tend to rely on the state's routes. So we default to the state because they're the ones responsible. We typically don't fund pavement and bridge on the interstate or the non-interstate NHS. So it really depends on the targets. Um, in terms of adding more above and beyond the 40 targets and measures we have to account for, I as staff am very reluctant for that because I'll be the one having to do the work and uh, it's a lot. So when somebody comes up and says we need a greenhouse gas emission target and measure, I am uh, reserved about how we want to approach that because we need to make sure we have the data resources available to be able to support that target. Because I don't want to put a target in and just have us immediately fail it because we have no support or backing of it through data or other means. So this this will be a hot topic when we get into it for the MTP, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of discussion about it. Any other questions from anyone about the goals, objectives, performance measures, or targets? Oh yes, uh, Ms. Alatel. Thank you. On that last point about the additional work, should we want to add performance uh, targets? You know. I, I don't want to preclude it, but your point is well taken and I'm hoping we can hopefully maybe help spread out some of that work by if we add performance targets, maybe have them being measured by other entities um, through other plans and reports. I don't know uh, if you have any thoughts about that. Uh, yes, good point. So we do actually, so I keep mentioning greenhouse gas because it's the one we've heard from the most. We are actually going to be working with Shana Kilcoin's group um, to look at greenhouse gas emissions, a uh, measure and target. And it, it's going to be kind of done in a, a simpler way because we're going to be using VMT data, vehicle miles travel data. 
we're going to try and use that as a way to estimate the emissions within our area that come from transportation and see if there's a way that we can say, okay, our MTP is showing a reduction of VMT. So how does that translate to greenhouse gas emission reductions? That'll help us potentially set a baseline because every measure and target needs a baseline with a, a period that you look at to say, okay, we're roughly heading up in this direction for greenhouse or we're heading down in this direction. So that's where we want to continue heading or, or we want to change. So in that example, we're going to try and work with another group that uses our data from the model to help calculate in kind of a different route. Um, we're going to try and work with other groups where possible, but it really depends on the target and we'll just have to look at it a case by case basis. If somebody is able to help us provide the data and help with support of the calculations and stuff, we would, of course, I would be more than happy to work with them to get that information. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm trying to keep uh, really quick. There's just a lot to go through. Okay, next step is criteria. Criteria is pretty easy. It's what we use to help determine uh, what projects that are nominated or brought forward help meet the goals and objectives and performance measures that we have outlined in our plan. Uh, criteria is really important because otherwise we just put anything under the sun under there. So it's a part of the process that we want to do. Um, here's an example of kind of what we're talking about for criteria. I know everyone's probably seen some criteria over the years, but I just wanted to put this in here. We can have an easy criterion on the right or on the left, and then we have the score that we would assign based on how the project is doing. So um, we develop these as part of the MTP. You will be involved in that. There will be a public process for that. Um, there's probably going to be a few different sets of criteria because we have different aspects that they would look at. Um, one thing to note, we try and keep our criteria consistent between plans. So we have an MTP set of criteria. We have a TIP set of criteria that you guys all know is out for review right now. Depending on what happens from that, we're going to use that as a basis to help formulate the MTP criteria so they can link up as much as possible. Please note that the criteria for the MTP and the, the TIP are going to be different. The MTP is a very high level 20 year plan that's more aspirational in its approach. Uh, the TIP is a very focused four year that is uh, more realistic in its approach for everyday things. So you are going to see some differences between the criteria, but we'll make a match as much as we can. Any questions on criteria? Yes. It may not be related, but um, have we completely gotten rid of, rid of illustrative category project? No. Okay. I can talk about that as the fiscal side of things uh, if you want to hold on for a second. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Awesome, thank you. Okay, here's another part, data analysis. This is a big one for us. What we have is the first is the status of the system. So the status of the system is basically our way of setting a baseline of where we're at in the transportation system. We say, okay, what are our modes look like for travel? So for example, here's from the 2040 MTP. It tells us mile of roads, miles of sidewalk, uh, transit routes, uh, pathways, multi-use pathways, and then railroad lines. So this is our good way to say, okay, here's where we're at right here, because then the next thing we have, I want to click out, is the deficiency analysis. It takes the status of the system and projects out to the end of our period, our horizon year, so 20 years out, and says, if we didn't do anything to our transportation system, what would it look like in 20 years? So then it's a way to help identify needs. As you can see, oh, as you can kind of see on this map, um, there are areas of red, uh, orange, and yellow, and those would be areas of concern that we would want to look at. How can we best address those areas through uh, any of the types of projects that we put into the MTP? I do want to note that this is a level of service based map from the 2040 MTP. For the next MTP update, we are looking at seeing if we can do something other than level of service, uh, VMT vehicle miles traveled, or uh, vehicle hours of delay. Um, we'll see how it goes. Level of service is a measure of delay, so it's just kind of a, a naming convention change, but level of service is more prone to smaller impacts at intersections than some of the other measures we would be looking at. Any questions on those? It's a lot of data. You guys will be involved. The public will be involved. Um, and it relates to our modeling efforts that we have to do. 
Um, I did want to mention, so the model. We do have to update our AMATS model. Uh, there are some requirements there. One of the requirements is, is that, hard to explain, but we have our base data that we put into the model. So our socioeconomic assumptions are based on, for example, our current model is 2013 data, because that's when we last updated the model, uh, the, the base information. EPA regulations requires for our area, because we're a maintenance area for air quality, that it's 10 years after your base data is when your model expires, basically. So in this case, 2023 is when it expires, which would be in the middle of our next update. So we're going to have to update our model. We're going to have to use the latest available data, which we choose would probably be 2019 or something like that. People often get confused because they say latest available. And when they think about that and they're looking at the plan in 2023, they think it should have the 2022 data because that's the latest available. For us, it's the latest available when we started our model update. We can't keep going back and updating it every time a new year comes along, or we'll never actually be able to finish our plan. So that's just the heads up. We will probably hear feedback from the public on that. Any questions on data? Okay. Uh, next, projects and fiscal constraint. One of my favorite parts. Projects. So where do we get projects from? And I think this might be answering Mr. Weddleton's. I'll, I'll try and get to, I think I know what you're talking about. We look at everything under the sun for where we can get projects, where we can get goals and objectives, even performance measures, everything. Any plan that's available uh, up to a point. Um, any plan that's updated or new since the last MTP update that we did. There's a couple reasons for that. One, some of the plans are pretty old. You know, a comprehensive plan is from two, early 2000s. So we try and match up with that as best we can, but we do use the newer one, which is the 2040 land use plan. There's other plans out there that are from like 2008. A lot of stuff has changed since then. So if we kept going back to the old plans that are outdated, it would be problematic for us in our current new look at things. So we do set anything that is new or updated since the last MTP. So for example, the 2040 MTP was updated in August of 2020. So anything from that point onward that is new or updated, we would look at. This Bernard Corridor plan and the AMATS non-motorized plans are two examples of projects that we would look at to incorporate into our new MTP update. <clears throat> Where else do we get projects from? The STIP, uh, that's the state's funding program, our own TIP. Um, and the reason we look at our own TIP is because there's an update lag cycle in between the MTP update and the TIP update, and there may be projects put into the TIP that we need to add to the MTP to make sure they're funded. Uh, DOT's 10-year plan, so that's their longer-term plan. The CIP, the Muni's funding program, I already mentioned other plans, and then project nominations. So we do have a nomination period where we do a call for nominations for anyone to submit any project that they want. We don't, you know, we would recommend somebody not submit a $20 billion project, but if somebody wants to submit that, they can. Each project that is submitted will be looked at and reviewed and scored and ranked. So... Uh, Mr. Weddleton, yes. So it, it seems like a line would be missing there because, you know, I would look at like our land use plan or, or our, broadly speaking, maybe our comprehensive plan. Uh, you know, some of them deal specifically with some roads and, you know, the land use plan may actually have some infrastructure that needs to be roads that could be part of it. And then we have the Tree Gash Way plan, Spinari Corridor plan, and even the Hillside District plan has a set of roads that, um, they are recommended, and, and I suspect sometime not too far in the future, we'll have some kind of plan for uh, secondary egress for wildfire and emergency um, routes for Eagle River and uh, Hillside. And um, but those are, I mean, how do those feed in then? Those would fall under the other plans category. So the 2040 land use plan is incorporated as part of our modeling effort because we do account for land use. Um, the comprehensive plan. It's a harder one because it's so dated. It's pretty old. But it's but when I say that comprehensive plan is that whole stack of plans. It's yeah. not just that initial one. You've got, I mean, the land use plan is part of that comprehensive plan. We call out the individual plans on their own to kind of like sure. designate where we get them from. And the Hillside District plan, I don't think it's been updated for a while. So it probably would have been looked at as part of the other MTPs. So we as staff wouldn't <laughs> look at it, but if somebody nominated the project from there, we would right. of course score and rank it. We just have to limit what we look at because if we're spending our entire budget and time looking at everything from, you know, 1970s onward, we, we would never really get anywhere. 
Um, but yeah, the two catch way transportation element, we would definitely look at if it's approved or in non-draft form by the time we get to it. I'm very reluctant to look at plans that are in draft form because they are subject to pretty significant changes between when they go out for the public and when they come back for final approval. So, um, but that is a discussion we have every time about should we include this or should we not? So uh, we'll make sure to have that as going. Thanks. Yep. Okay, next fiscal analysis. This is my this is my thing because I grew up learning this and I was over at DOT. Oh, there's a lot to unpack here, but two things to remember. The fiscal analysis is the second most important thing in the MTP, and it is a requirement that we have to do. So what does it mean? It's pretty easy. We basically have to show that whatever project list we are putting in the MTP, we can fund with reasonable revenue sources over the 20 year period of the plan. So what do you mean by reasonable? Well, there has to be some kind of historical data on it, or there has to be some kind of current movement on it. So a good example is when we did the 2035 MTP update, the state was looking at a transportation fund in the legislature. So they actually had some people acting on it and we could look at it, get some information for them about how much it would be every year. And we could put that in as a funding source. When we did the 2040 update, that was no longer being acted upon. So we had to remove it as a funding source. So for the next update, we would do the same thing. If the Muni is acting on something in the assembly or the administration, or if the state is acting on something that's not one of our traditional sources of funding, we would probably include it in there if there's enough forward momentum. If it's just a random idea we have in a meeting at some point, say, let's just add $100 million for this that may eventually happen. Uh, I'm not going to be the one to recommend putting that in there because you have to actually have good support for why that's being put in there and just random ideas that pop up in your head. You know, are kind of iffy uh, when FHWA looks at the fiscal analysis. So what are some of our historical, you know, solid guaranteed ones? States funding for DOT and PF that they get the federal funds that come to our area. Uh, the municipal CIP funding that they put towards projects for bonding or that they bonded for and put towards projects. AMATS funding, public transportation's funding, the railroad's funding. Um, and then there's, a, there's others that we can put in. It is a mixture of federal and non-federal. Um, and one of the things to keep uh, a reminder of, I know it's uh, not a popular topic, we are very careful about what projects we put in and who's going to pay for what. It's, it's not really our place to put some other organization on the hook saying they will pay for this, they will implement it, and they will do it. So when we do our fiscal analysis and our project evaluation, we have a very cooperative uh, uh, couple of meetings, work sessions, that kind of stuff to talk with the state, Muni, AMATS, and everyone else who wants to be involved. Say, okay, does this funding source make sense, et cetera. There's a lot that goes into this. Um, we'll be starting this update very soon because we need to make sure we are fiscally constrained when we're talking about our project lists that we go forward on. So any questions on kind of the funding side of things? Yes. To be clear, the, the constraint is regarding AMATS allocation, not everything else. Right. In other words, the Department of Transportation does projects within the Anchorage AMATS area mm -hmm. um, for its own facilities that are not, they need to be on the tip, but they're not funded with the allocation, AMATS allocation. Right. So it doesn't matter, we have to account for it. Okay, because those numbers flex up and down. All yes, and that's why you use historical data to get kind of an average right. to level it out more because we do recognize there's the up and downs. Uh, you know, geo bonds, state geo bonds have historically been just a one hit. And you can, you know, when we do our thing, you can see the graph that we put in and there's these big ups and that tends to be geo bonds or other things like that. Uh, we have to account for anything state, you know, non-federal or federal funded. It doesn't matter. We have to account for it as part of our program. Some of the, con the concern is some of the confusion comes in that when they see this hundred million dollar plus or minus number coming in, they think that that's all within an AMATS allocation. And it's not the actual allocation itself is significantly smaller, but yet yeah. the assumption is they can influence the entire $100 million plus or minus pot, not just the AMATS allocation pot. So there, I think there was a desire to try to draw that distinction between the allocation and non-allocation related projects so that there would be a better understanding of how that can be influenced in anyway. Yeah, I think for the 2050 update, we're going to work on that because we did hear about that kind of at the last MTP update. And we, we tried a couple of different solutions and 
We'll see. What I'm thinking is we'll probably have just different pots of funding and say, this is how much we anticipate overall for DOTs or munis or AMASs. And then when we put projects in, we talk about who's responsible entity for it or, you know, who, who's, I don't want to say ownership. I don't, I don't really know the correct word, but which pot does that go towards? And then when we make adjustments to removing projects or adding projects, we have to be very careful of where we're removing it from. The overall fiscal constraint is the bottom line, but I understand there needs to be some nuances within the individual funding lines. And we'll, we'll try and work on something, um, but it may be one of those things that we may not get it right at the beginning, but I hope by the end everyone's satisfied. Okay, any other questions or comments on the fiscal? Okay. Uh, next one. Okay, policies and actions. This one's pretty pretty standard as well. Sometimes there's uh, things that we want to do that aren't project construction or planning project specific, you know, directions that AMATS wants to head in towards helping to reduce non-single occupancy vehicle travel or other things like that, that it's really hard to nail down with one specific project. So we put in these actions or policy items. Please note actions and policies that we list in this portion of the MTP are AMATS only. Um, I'm very reluctant to put policies and actions that dictate what other entities should be doing. Uh, we can work with them to develop their own policies and actions, but I am going to be very reluctant to put in something that says the Muni must do this or DOT must do this. It's we develop it for ourselves and then we work with our partner agencies in developing theirs if they're interested or not. I do have, sorry, it is very hard for me to read even. Uh, so an action, for example, is investigate congestion management alternatives to roadway expansion projects. Pretty straightforward. We do that anyways as part of our planning process with uh, a few acronyms all throughout the Transportation Demand Management, TDM, sorry, you've all heard of that, or TISMO, Transportation System Management Operations. Those are programs that we have in place that help us look at alternatives to roadway expansion with reducing congestion. Policies. Uh, can be overarching policies such as develop an interconnected network of streets where appropriate, you know, for emergency response, evacuation, disaster, easing a variety of travel, and to promote even distribution of traffic. So these are really important because they give staff feedback on kind of what direction AMATS as a whole is heading in, and that helps influence what kind of projects we're going to be looking at as part of the project list. I'm not saying we will discount roadway expansion projects with things like this. It's just a factor to keep in mind, we have these policies or actions of where we want to head. Are our projects helping us get there or not? Any questions on this? So this will be another public comment period where everyone will be involved and we'll be doing a lot of development of these. So this will happen kind of throughout the process itself. So, okay. Okay. So uh, go ahead and leave here. Don't click on the picture, please. I got to remember this. So I'll be upfront and honest. Um, I am the weakest on air quality, but we have awesome air quality individuals on all of our committees, so I'm not worried about it in one bit. However, if I do screw up, I apologize and please correct me. <laughs> I didn't screw up with the TAC, so I'm very hopeful I don't screw up here. So I mentioned that the fiscal constraint was the second most important thing. The first most important thing is the air quality conformity determination. That is what FHWA and FDA approve. They don't actually approve any other aspects of the MTP. They give their approval of the air quality conformity, and that gives approval to everything else that fall that the air quality approves or that, that the air quality covers. In order to have an air quality conformity determination, you have to have a fiscal constraint analysis because you have to be able to say, this is our list of projects, and this is how it affects air quality within our area. Because if you just had a list endless, beginning of time, you'd be like, yeah, our air quality is perfect forever. We don't have to worry about anything. Or subsequently, you don't know how it will impact or negatively or positively impact your area. So what do we look at for air quality conformity determination? We look at three criteria, CO, PM 2.5, which is wood smoke, and PM 10, which is dust. And say, these will not directly inhibit the implementation of our SIP program which is our statewide implementation program. My understanding is our kind of air quality program that says, here's how we can help keep our air quality in acceptable levels throughout our state. There are three measures in the SIP that we have to make sure we implement all the time until the end of time. And that is transit marketing, transit ride share, and air quality 
and Air Quality Business and Public Education Campaign. We fund those as part of our TIP. You'll see them in our CMAC chapter, so we have to make sure that we're constantly funding them. So AMATS is a limited maintenance, or it is a maintenance area with a limited maintenance plan. So what that means is we start out as attainment. We had no air quality problems. At some point in time, we had some air quality problems. It became non-attainment, which means we had to do a lot more effort in terms of modeling and budgets for air quality. And then we worked really hard and became a maintenance area with limited maintenance plan. That after set periods of time, we'll transition back to not having any limited maintenance plans, which means less air quality stuff that we have to do. Right now, we have a pretty limited amount of air quality stuff we have to do, and it's basically the air quality conformity determination. This is complicated. We'll get into it more as the program develops. Uh, it is put out for the public comment to see. You guys will see it. I'm hoping we can probably have people like uh, Matt Stichick and Cindy Heil give more information on it as time goes on. Uh, but Matt Stichick has been an amazing resource for us in terms of making sure we understand what's going on and helping to keep us not having any exceedances for air quality. Any questions on this particular item? Okay. Um, okay, so one of the last things is after we've done all of the work for goals, objectives, performance measures, targets, project selection, fiscal constraint analysis, air quality determination, all that's gone out, we've put the document together. Here's our approval process. First thing we do is an interagency review and resource agency review. Uh, interagency review would be like DOT, the municipality of Anchorage, other agencies that we partner with to say, what do you guys think of the overall plan? You know, is there anything we got wrong or that we're missing? And resource agency review is a requirement that we have to do. So we have to go to like DNR or Corps of Engineers and we have to get them to review the document and say, okay, how is it impacting the resources that they manage? And are they okay with it? Do they wanna see changes? We have a whole chapter where we have to write about the resources uh, section of things. So it's a lengthy little process that we have to do. Um, as you can see the process down there, this is new, so that's why I'm a little, uh, it's about a year for the MPO approval at this point, uh, from starting at this interagency review to getting the policy committee's final review and approval is about a year's time. That's our estimated time. That's what we want to give because then that allows the public, community councils, uh, the assembly, the policy committee, everyone, a very good amount of time to be able to review, provide comments, and give us an opportunity to make changes based on those comments. Mr. Weddleton. We were just reading that you say process is estimated to take one year for the MPO approval and MPO is a maps. Do you mean MTP approval? No, I'll get to that in process. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So this is just getting it from the interagency one here. I'll let me go. Let me go through this. Sorry. Uh, after we do the interagency, then we do the public review draft and the public comment period. And at the same time, we also do the assembly public hearing period, bring it for the assembly's uh, review and recommendations to the policy committee. There is a timeline built in for that, by the way. It, uh, the assembly has 45 days, unless extended by this body here, to provide comments to AMATS or we move forward with the process. And that's built into our interoperating agreement and code. So once all that's done and all the comments come in, staff look at it, make our recommendations, it goes to the technical advisory committee for their review and recommendations, and then to the policy committee for their review and approval. There's another step after this I'll get to in a minute. Anybody have any questions on the review and approval process? It's a lengthy one, so just heads up. Are we talking about 2025 kind of dates here or 2022 kind of dates? So we left it generic because this could be used at a later time. But for the 2050 MTP, our hope is to have everything ready for the review and approval process by 2023 timeframe. So then we do 2023 into 2024 and then have the final approvals in 2024. Because we have to be done with our MTP FHW approval August 24th of 2024. So that is our hard and fast deadline. We have already gotten slapped on the wrist by FHWA because we missed our deadline for the last MTP and they gave us a corrective action, which is one of the worst things they could give us uh, besides a complete decertification. Uh, and that's what we were trying to avoid. So. Just as a heads up, I'm going to be very uh, focused on that deadline for the 2050 update. Decertification of an MPO. 
Yes, it can happen. Which means you wouldn't be able to expend federal funds within the census. Here. It would mean a whole lot of problems for everyone, not just AMATS. So, um, and yeah, just to be clear, if we don't get our NTP approved in time, we go into a conformity lapse, which means there's no air quality conformity, which means no federal funds can be, no new phases of federal projects can be started. There are certain projects that are exempt from it, pavement replacement or pavement projects and transit projects are exempt from that. So it's it's something just kind of keep in mind as we're moving forward, there is a there is a roadblock <laughs> if we're not careful. Okay, next, um, FHWA approval. This is pretty easy. After the MPO approves it, we then send it to FHWA and FTA for their approval of the air quality conformity determination. So this is something we try and give them maybe three, three or four months to do. We'd like longer, but we've done a month and they've done a turnaround, but that's been really not okay. So we're gonna try and do three to four months to give them plenty of time to review it and provide any comments they have to us and then give final approval for it. Any questions? I know that was a lot. And so I thank you very much for sticking with me. Um, I'm very excited for the project to begin and bring back 2050 MTP stuff for you guys. So, yes. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so my question actually jumps back quite a ways. I wasn't fast enough to get my hand raised um, when you were going through it, but when we were talking about the documents um, or the plans in which we would look at to select projects, um, is there any policy determination made um, as to where those projects come from, or is it just staff calling? Um, I guess I just wanted to know, has there ever been policy guidance given for where to look? Um, that's a, it's an interesting one because a lot of it comes from the Code of Federal Regulations that designate, you know, that directs us on what we're supposed to be doing because it outlines what ask or what things we're supposed to be looking at as part of our MTP update. For example, it requires that we look at the strategic highway safety plan that DOT has, that the state has. Um, it requires us to look at HSIP and incorporate that into our process. Um, in terms of an exhaustive list of everything that we look at, uh, I don't know of any policy that we have, and I don't know of anything from FHWA that says, here's every single thing you need to look at. Uh, so this has been based on historical, uh, what we've done historically and what we think is the best right now. Okay, thanks for that clarification. I wonder if beyond um, one, um, I'd love the the legal site for what's absolutely required. And then, you know, it's something to think about if there are plans that we typically include, you know, we've done it by practice, um, but if there's a policy call because, it's, you know, we have to limit it at some level, um, it may, may, set, may make sense uh, for this body to take up um, and provide some guidance. And I wanted, would want to make sure we did that, you know, at the right time so it didn't delay anything. Thanks. Um, so I'll clarify on that. So typically what we do at the beginning of the MTP update cycle is we get a resolution passed by the policy committee that sets those kind of strength, constraints of what we're going to be looking at, what we're going to be updating. And in that resolution, I believe it has something in there about the projects and plans that we are, or the plans that we're going to be looking at, and because it talks about anything that's updated since the last new or updated since the last MTP. Uh, and I believe it's it might actually specifically call out like the Spinard Corridor plan and the non-motorized plan as the big examples of that. So I can make sure we get that resolution to everyone so you kind of have a good understanding of where our boundaries are for this update cycle. But in terms of the Code of Federal Regulations, um, I'll go ahead and just list it off. We are 23 CFR 450.100, 200, 300, and 400. 100 is definitions, 400 is appendix, 300 is mostly dealing with the MTP, but it's kind of smattered throughout. So my recommendation is go through 100 through 400, and that kind of gives you a good idea of what we have to do. Because there's some things that say, as your planning process, you need to be looking at that. That covers us, even if it doesn't directly say the MTP itself. Got yes. it. I'd still ask for an email follow-up because I, I may uh, lose yes, track uh, of that. 
No, we're, I was just doing that for the record. We'll send you an email follow up to the, the committee of the locations for the federal regulations as well as the resolution. Great. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it. Well, uh, two yeah. quick questions. Who's the project manager at RNF for the MTP? Uh, Juan Lee. And uh, if uh, the MMATS or whatever they're going to call the MPO out in the valley does uh, come to fruition during the MTP, is there any requirement for coordination with that MTO that's adjacent to this one? We're required to coordinate regardless. Um, the Masu Valley is a significant impact on our transportation system. So part of that is we're supposed to coordinate with other organizations. So one of the ways we do that is we do incorporate their network, their modeling or their network of roads and TAZ allocations, populations, that kind of stuff into our model, as well as work with the borough mayor and all the different groups out there for their review of uh, our plan or projects or other things like that. So we already do uh, work with them. If the MPO happens in the middle of this MTP update, yeah, we'll probably reach out, but it depends because the likelihood is they're not going to be really on their feet as we are by that point, if it happens at all. Uh, but we will account for them as needed, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, concerns? OK, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Craig, any other plan and project updates? No, I do not have any. OK, um, agenda item 7A, AMAT's quarter three obligation report, correct? So this is just tracking the status of the TIP obligations. It's the third quarter, and so it requires us to be within plus or minus 5% of our total allocation, and we're at uh, 0.42, 0.42%, so we're about as good as you can get. Um, it's just uh, not too much to add, but we're Tracking like we're supposed to, spending the dollars that, that we have planned to spend in, the, in that area. Unless James has anything fun and exciting to add, that's about it. Okay, see, there you go. Any questions or comments from the committee on that? Okay. And there, item eight, committee comments. Any comments in general for Wellington? Um, well, I just uh, you, you prompted a question. What do you know? What's going on with the valley? Is it MPO? Uh, James, do you know a status on the MPO out in the valley right now? Uh, James started with the uh, DOT in that planner. Uh, no, nothing beyond you know continuing uh, continuing work uh, through their their working committee uh, to to lay the lay the foundation. I think there's some. Uh, I think they're. I think they're at a at a at a, at a bit of an inflection point where they're trying. They're, they're taking a look at what work they are doing and kind of uh, taking a, taking a breath and seeing uh, just what needs to be done uh, in the next coming cycles. Um, I'm sure if we reached out to Matsu uh, Borough, uh, we can get them to provide some sort of update. Thank you. Just a little insight. So I'm on their their uh, steering committee. Um, the process that they're at right now is basically they're working on their what could be their work program for the next couple of years. Again, that's like our UPWP, our planning funds. Um, they are working on what would be the composition. They obviously won't know the boundaries for a while, so they won't know for sure who might have to include it. You know, if it got up, if the boundary included the city of Houston, then they would have to include members of that local government, but if it doesn't, then that would not be included. Um, they're looking at what native uh, tribes would need to be included. Um, and they're also coming up with a name. So whether it's uh, Matsu Valley MV, uh, MPO, the MVP or M Mats, or there are all sorts of choices. So big, big question there. Um, who sets the boundaries? Uh, the, the boundaries are when it gets designated by the governor. So, and that's, um, you know, it's based on census tracts. They look at what what is the urbanized area today and what would be the urbanized area in the next 20 years, which is why, you know, for example, in, in Anchorage, you know, we don't go down to Girdwood because it's not expected in 20 years. It'll have the population that would require us to take that into account. So 
uh, they look at the census tracts and then with the governor, they designate it and set those boundaries. So thanks. Yeah, we've already transferred at least one hundred thousand dollars for planning, and I think there's another hundred thousand there in front. Um, but my understanding is we've got ten proposed seats on the uh, policy committee. There are five of the borough, City of Palmer, City of Wasilla, Department of Transportation, and two tribal seats. I guess voted on. So, so. Yeah, that's the current proposal. Okay, it kind of makes it odd for. Ideally, you'd have an odd number. I, I, I did suggest that. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's the uh, of not getting a tie vote every time. Yeah. But we'll see. But that's the current. Any other questions? No, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the Mayor Bronson appreciates this. Uh, getting into the AMATS process now, a new administration, we're very, very focused on the, the long term transportation plan of the municipality. Uh, I used to serve on this board 25 years ago. Uh, things have changed a lot, so uh, looking forward to participating with you and taking the city forward on what we need for transportation in the next 40 years. Thank you. Appreciate it. Spoke to you. Zolotel, do you have any comments? No, thanks. Okay. Uh, a couple things from DOT. Um, Craig, I think I sent you some type of AMATS boundary inquiry with regard to the refuge. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just assume that you'll reply to that. I was going to confirm that with you. Happy to re happy to reply. Okay. Um, there's also been a lot of inquiries on reauthorization uh, for the Transportation Act. Um, there is a, uh, almost across the board a 40 percent increase in formula funds expected, um, and that will trickle down to AMEX allocations. So um, we're already talking with staff. Um, the bill has not been signed yet, and the stimulus bills have not been signed yet, but. Uh, Big increase in the formula funds, so 40 percent expected expected there, but also a significantly large amount of money in the form of grant funds. And so um, I'm, we're working at DOT to try and get someone on board to help us with a strategy to move forward with that. Uh, I would hope and assume that the city is also um, going to come up with some kind of strategy for grant funds. There's a whole lot of funds that would be applicable to the Port of Anchorage, for instance. Um, Got our interest. The key word would be the use of the word resiliency over and over and over. <laughs> but literally, uh, Senator Murkowski and our um, we have right now. Yeah, yeah. Senator Murkowski and our congressional delegation have done a huge amount of effort. You'll see their fingerprints all over those things. Uh, rural um, ferry systems, yeah. for instance. How many states have rural ferry systems? Not many. So um, we see really some huge opportunities here, and hope that the the city administration, the assembly, and uh, and the state as well, of course, uh, take a huge advantage of that. So these grants say this is a grant for this kind of project that we apply. Correct. Yeah, you so we need to be geared up to apply. Yeah, you need to be geared up, and you need to have a real strategy to it. Some of these grants have no match required, and some of them have big matches required. There are strings attached to all kinds of these different types of grants. But again, I think our congressional delegation did a huge lift for us on that. They've teed it up for us. I think. Uh, uh, we would be remiss not to really lean forward. Um, for DOT's part of it, we have to use state funds to go after those grants. We can't use federal funds. So I have to go, uh, and the commissioner has to go convince the governor to give us a couple million dollars in state money to go for those grants. But the return on investment is potentially huge. So, Can you, what deadlines do we have? Um, well, they actually haven't all been signed yeah, into yeah. lots so of so. But are we looking like by the end of the year? Or do you think? Uh, what I heard today was three months. Approximately three months. Pretty quick, then. And that was actually, I heard that from Mark Beggers. <laughs> and he's who the city's also using to track the funding for the, for the port. So we're in line. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. He's doing a good job. Or is there something that mm -hmm. solved up to speed? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we should have that. Yep. So, anyway, huge changes coming. Um, the fiscally constrained um, things that we deal with in your in AMATS will be uh, uh, only go up. Even if they're half wrong, it's still a significant increase. Um, and so anything we can do to get Mr. Amundsen and his crew and Mr. Bolin and his crew to lean forward. Also, the uh, funding on the FAA side is doubling. So it's not 40 percent. It's literally doubling. And I yeah, believe you get enough money. I believe you own an airport. Bar, but. <laughs> I believe you own an airport. So my yeah, we do. take advantage of that as well. So we are going to, I know, struggle to try and navigate all those aviation. Things. Well, well <laughs> uh, the bulk of them are for primary airports as well, which I believe Merrill Field is a primary airport. Yep. 
So sure will. Anyway, just a heads up on that. Um, we talked about MS already. Um, just so you know, also in Meg's I'll tell I, I, I'll send you the email as well. I sent it to Mr. Constance. SewardGlenMobility.com is the name of the website for the Seward to Glen uh, Planning and Environmental Linkage Study. So that's a newly stood up website. I know Mr. Constance is constantly uh, wanting updates on that one, but that's a good spot to go to for current updates. If it does not look current, um, it's Jim Amundsen's fault as always. So feel free to reach out to Mr. Amundsen and tug on his period. There you go. Other than that, um, appreciate it, everybody's uh, participation. Any other last minute comments? Okay. All right. Any? Well, we don't have any public on the line, do we? We do. Okay. No comments. No comments. All right. Well, given that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Adjourn. Second. Second. All right. We've seconded. Any objections? Everyone, motion approved. Thank you, everyone, for your participation today. I do have to ask, what time did this start? Uh, one thirty. Okay, I wasn't like I had a one thirty in my my calendar. Okay. I came in five and say it sounded like you were halfway through the agenda. Oh, well, the, okay. The first couple of bullets. So okay, okay, fair enough. Well, yeah, a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, we know, yeah.